Hey guys, Jim Daneker here. Welcome to the Fortress of Synthitude or the Temple of Boom. I'm still not sure what exactly I call this place, but it's my personal studio and it is chock full of synthesizers. Back at the beginning of COVID in spring of 2020, I suddenly found myself home from the road. We had a tour cancel and uh, I took that time to completely rebuild my studio. I had wanted to optimize some things, move things around, I brought in a couple new pieces of gear, took some out. And um, when I was finished, I did a little tour video that I think hit, gosh, 50 or 60,000 views in, in a couple weeks. And um, it generated a lot of really good questions. In the interim, uh, you know, in the course of a couple years when you're working, you always find things you want to improve. You know, you want to move this over here and move that over there. And uh, as a keyboard player, of course, I'm always buying and selling synthesizers, uh, changing things out. So I thought um, after enough of that, I wanted to take some time to, to do all this again, to kind of really break it all down optimize everything and rewire some stuff and and make improvements and my schedule is always so busy I, I, I can rarely do that but um, it got to a point back in June of this year 2022 that um, it, it, it needed to be done uh, wiring had gotten out of control and I was about to start some some new projects that really necessitated this so back in June I tore it all apart I gave myself um, I had hoped I could do it in a weekend but it ended up taking four days and uh, so I'm gonna take you back there now we're gonna go back in time a couple months and um, I'll show you the process I will um, give you some updates along the way why I did what I did why I made some of the decisions I did what gear I'm using and why and I wanted to go into to a little bit more detail with this one, take you around the room, play all the synths a little bit, let you hear what they sound like, maybe answer some questions, maybe generate some more good questions. Before I jump in, just know this, this is not a sponsored video. I'm not one of these YouTubers who, you know, has got corporate sponsors or anything like that. I just wanna share this with you and hope that it helps give you some ideas for optimizing your workspace. I do have some affiliate links in the uh, video description below. If you are interested in any of the gear I'm showing, check out the, the gear by the affiliate links and that uh, should be able to help me a little bit in the future to do more of these videos. Um, again, this is not what I do full time, it's just for fun. And yes, last but not least, please do subscribe. I would love to um, count you as, as a follower and, and subscriber and uh, all that good stuff. And feel free to reach out to me with any questions that I haven't answered here. Okay, enough blabbing. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go. Hey guys, Jim here. Forgive my grubby appearance. I'm in my work clothes because it is hot in Nashville today. It's almost 100 degrees outside, which means the air conditioning is struggling to keep up. And I'm about to tear my whole studio apart and rebuild it, which is going to take a few days and um, it's not going to be fun. So anyway, since I posted about this, a few of you have uh, messaged me and asked if I would document this process and explain why I'm doing this. Um, because if you look at some of my previous tour videos, I, I did one a couple years ago and then Andrew Masters did one uh, last year. Um, the studio looks fantastic. It looks really well thought out because it is, uh, and and there's a lot that goes into it. And one of the biggest questions I get is why would you why would you take the time to do this? And the short answer is that over the course of a year or two, when you've kind of retooled everything and put everything where you want it, you discover things that could be improved. And after um, in this case, it's been at least two years since I've really done this right, and it gets to a point where. There's enough stuff, you know, I, I keep a list of, you know, sometime I, I'd like to improve this or that, I'd like to move this over here and, and so on. And eventually that list gets long enough to, to justify the time it takes to do this. So uh, I think what I'll do is I'll quick show you around as things are right now, and then I will kind of document as I go what I'm doing and why and, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna turn the camera around, walk you through the room real quick, and then I will, keep you up to date as I go. Okay, here we go. All right, so this is the general layout of the room. Um, it's, you know, the big horseshoe shaped thing. You got synths on all sides, basically. Um, so what's wrong with it? Well, one of the things is that this particular rack over here, I don't like that it's out in the room. There's, there's about two feet of space between that and the wall so that I can get back there and get behind everything if I need to. I wanna fix that because I also don't like how this looks when you walk in the room. I hate seeing cables, so I wanna clean that up. I wanna push this whole rack over here 
I want to push that whole thing up against this wall. Um, that'll buy me some more space from left to right. And then for symmetry, I'm going to do the same thing over here. The problem is right now, there's my console. I got this Yamaha O2R96. And the thing is, I love this console. It sounds fantastic. Problem with this is it takes up a lot of space, it takes up a whole corner of this room. And because it's sitting on this rack and I've got a keyboard here, everything's just a little claustrophobic. So what I'd love to do is for symmetry's sake, um, I want to move one of my keyboard racks, uh, this one here, I want to move it back into that corner so it matches kind of what's going on on this side. So a little bit more symmetrical. Another factor is that I am waiting on delivery of my Oberheim OBX8, which will be sometime in July or August. So where am I going to put that? Another factor that, that kind of bothers me is when I'm sitting down and I wheel over to one of these keyboard racks, you know, only one of them is really going to be at ideal playing height. So I kind of want to tweak that a little bit. I'd, I'd like to get it so that I can have two keyboards on each stand that are really ideal, you know, for programming and working with each one. So I kind of want to split them up a little bit. I got another stand coming where I can have three on this side of the room. One of them is going to go back here where this stuff is right now. So when you look at, at my diagram of what I'm going to do here, I'm going to have one stand here. I'm going to have, you know, the one in the middle here, and then I'll have the 80s wall on the left. Um, so one question somebody asks is, what about symmetry? What about your room? You're going to have all these keyboards on one side and not as many on the other. It really doesn't matter as long as the sweet spot where you sit to listen and work all day, as long as it's symmetrical there, um, and your monitor placement is is dialed in, you're okay. And um, I take a lot of time. I've got these big PMC monitors, which are the best monitors I've ever heard, honestly. Um, so between that and having everything symmetrical at the mix position, you're good to go. Um, is the room perfect? No. Um, no room is unless you're in a proper, you know, built from the ground up studio. But I've taken a lot of time to kind of dial everything in here. And this room actually sounds fantastic. I can mix in here, no problem. So anyway, those are the general overall reasons for why I want to do this. Another factor is that behind everything, which I can't get a camera back there, it's a mess. After two years of this current setup and always moving synths around and bringing some in and, you know, selling some and all that kind of stuff, it gets to be a rat's nest of cables behind everything. And so this will give me an opportunity once I break everything down, play with some placement, get, get you know, all my keyboards exactly where I want them. Um, I'm going to move my Argosy console desk out just a couple inches, which will help me improve my imaging with my speakers. Um, and I'll get rid of the console. Um, it'll let me clean everything up, rewire everything. So I'm just using what I need to. It'll make um, troubleshooting easier when and if things arise, which is pretty rare. But um, overall, it just kind of lets me tweak where everything is, which over the course of uh, you know working, it really adds up. When your stuff is exactly where you want it, it's easy to get to. It just makes work all the more pleasurable when you've got to sit in here all day long. Uh, another thing, this particular rack right now, you know, I've got the Matrix Brute, the System 8, the Jupiter X, and the Hydrosynth. One of the problems here, again, is that only the middle two are really accessible. I can't really play the Hydrosynth, and this thing deserves to be played front and center. So I'm going to move that here on, onto my desktop where the Pro 3 is right now. Why do I do that? Well, you know, I've got the 88 note keyboard here, which I use for most things, but there are times when I just want to reach up really quick and I want to play something on an unweighted synth action as opposed to 88 weighted keys. When I'm programming orchestral stuff uh, or drums and percussion, I like playing that stuff on an unweighted synth. Well, this one's only three octaves. The Hydra synth is four and it's got this uh, polyphonic aftertouch key bed. So for that reason and for the sound design aspects, of, you want to be able to hear this thing in the middle between a pair of speakers in stereo. So moving that up there is going to be a big improvement. Okay, that's, um, that's it in a nutshell. I've talked enough. It's time to get started. I'm going to rip everything apart. First things first, I'm going to experiment with moving this stuff back, see how that looks. 
take some inventory, see what kind of cabling I need, visit my storage um, <laughs> down in the garage, and uh, you know, start taking notes and see what works. So the other thing I need to do is I'm taking that console to a friend of mine's tomorrow, so I gotta take the console out, uh, decommission that, unwire everything in that rack, which is kind of centerpiece of the whole studio. So that's, uh, yeah, that's gonna be fun. But the upside is I'm simplifying all this stuff. Um, last thing, people have asked, what are you gonna replace that console with? Well, for now, um, I've just got a, um, an analog submixer, which I'm gonna use. It's just an old Mackie 16 channel rack mixer um, that's gonna go kind of over in this section. But that will free up this whole corner. And eventually, though, what I'm going to do, Yamaha has this digital mixer rack system. It's, it's based on the Dante protocol. So as soon as those are available again, I'm going to have one of those kind of take over um, for the O2R, which I'm going to miss that thing because it's beautiful, it sounds fantastic, and it's a killer console. But I don't need all that functionality. Um, I just basically need a patch bay to get all of my synths into my audio interface. Okay, there you go. That's enough talking. Here we go. The room is in shambles. Uh, took the O2R console out last night. And um, this is what's left of the corner, this rack. This is one of the big problems. This is why I wanted to redo everything among the ergonomic things. I can't take this. Um, it, it, troubleshooting, you know, or, or changing things when I want to add or change out a synth, this is just unmanageable. And never actually in my adult life have I allowed cables to get this messy. It drives me crazy. I like them neat and clean so you can trace something when there's a problem. So this is all gonna get undone, taking it all down to zero and yeah, rewiring all of it. So yay. I'm also gonna clean up uh, the cable runs to the synth racks back here. Um, adding some new stuff, taking some things away. So that's all gonna get redone. Um, I do have this side kind of just roughed in. I like, actually I love this. I love how that looks. Um, all three synths from my seating position, I can reach all three, no problem. And their panels are, are angled, you know, in a way that makes them easy to work with. So love that. I think that's a keeper. Um, I decided on this whole thing, I'm going to keep you know, uh, the Hydra synth here, front and center, and my beloved Access Virus. This is this might be one of my favorite synths of all time. And having this here will give me controls I can map to pretty much any plugin, which is awesome. I got my envelope controls, filters, and, and it's a pretty traditional layout. So that will map one-to-one -to, -one to pretty much any software synth, which is great. I love having that guy front and center. The Hydra synth, I kind of decided to try that here because um, this thing is such a sound design uh, monster that you really need to hear it properly in stereo to really hear what you're doing. And it's got this poly aftertouch key bed, which is great. Um, a lot of newer stuff accepts that for, for control. And uh, so I'm looking forward to having that front and center. And then um, still haven't decided on some rack stuff. But yeah, that's that's update on day two. About to tear into this and rip this rack apart and clean up all the cables. So <laughs> not fun. Anyway, okay, onward. Okay, day three. Um, things are still completely a mess. Things get worse before they get better, right? <laughs> uh, definitely making progress though, even though it doesn't look like it. Um, I still am really, really happy with that right keyboard rack. I love those analog synths together. Uh, you might wonder, what in the world did I do all day yesterday that I haven't made more progress? It's just a ton of moving things around, experimenting with placement. I'm really happy with that. Love those three. I wanted access to those a little bit easier, so I like having those there on my left. Underneath, um, Nerve Central, kind of my, my two old school eMagic MIDI interfaces, 20 years old, still working great. The Apollo rack, the main one, then there's the Apollo desktop. Those are tied together, those are my audio interfaces. And 
right here in the middle, that is where this Roland Jupiter X and then the Oberheim OBX8, when that shows up, those will be right there. And then uh, the rack's turned sideways right now, you can't see it, but a sub mixer in there for keyboards. So working on that section today, uh, the 80s wall, that's gonna stay as is. So I'll just have to play with placement a little bit. But yeah, that's, um, that's where we're at right now. So day three, here we go. Okay, day four, um, I know it looks like an insane mess still, because it is. I actually have high hopes of finishing today though. Believe it or not, I made a ton of progress yesterday. It's just that it's all behind the scenes where you can't see. Um, the, the main nerve center rack where all the MIDI connections for the whole room and all the audio connections, those are all wired back there. It's nice and clean and neat. And I got that key station in place. Um, got a lot of stuff done inside the console, which again, you can't see. So all I gotta do is wire up that rack and put the middle key stand in place. And that's basically it. Then I can start cleaning up and take inventory. I got a lot of cable management to do underneath and um, you know, uh, tidy things up and double check everything but uh, I also check everything when I make a connection when everything's torn apart like this I check it first to make sure it works before I wire everything up and before it's um, or I should say before I tile the cables down so that's also another crucial step make sure your your stuff is tested before you think you're done so okay day four here we go Okay, so these two are obviously probably the top icons of the 80s. You got the DX7 Mark II and the D50. Um, of course, the DX7, everybody knows what these sound like. Uh, you know, if you really want to hear the, um, <laughs> the sound. That's, you know, that's what you'd want to go to a DX7 for. Now you run that through some effects, it sounds killer. But the D50, um, to this day, this thing just does some incredible pads and soundscapes. That is. Gotta love those two. 
Then we come to these two. Uh, man, I love, I don't know why, I, I love these old synths with these vacuum fluorescent displays. Just such a cool technology back in the day. Um, unfortunately, the Matrix 6 is not hooked up uh, at the moment, so I can't play anything from this because I'm in the middle of sampling a bunch of stuff from it. Um, but uh, yeah, this thing actually is a favorite of the 80s. It, it just has a really cool analog vibe about it. The VFX was kind of a, um, man, how do you describe this thing? It just does some really unique things, kind of like the D50. Really airy. I mean, man, that's straight out of the D50, but it's got a, it's got a more of a hi-fi kind of thing to it. Really lots of airy top end. But it can do chord that was. Can do some pretty big sassy, you know, sounds. And uh, kind of did some stuff a little bit like the Korg Wave Station as well, like that last one. Anyway, I uh, love this thing. It does some, some really cool stuff. Okay, two of the most contentious synthesizers of the last few years. Brand new, just came out, the Oberheim OBX8. Um, most of you know what this is. This is um, essentially a reissue of the three OB series synths, the uh, OBX, the OBXA, and the OB8 um, from 1979 to 1983. Um, this thing is absolutely monstrous. It's all analog from beginning to end and um, having played the originals uh, it, it it's uh, you know people say what they want. It is totally the real deal. Now um, in this initial firmware one of the things I don't like about it is you can't, I'm in double mode right now. Um, so I've got the same sound panned, uh, I've got the same sound layered and panned apart. Um, so if I start changing stuff, it's only gonna change one side. So I'm told that they're working on, um, uh, in an update, a way to adjust both sides at the same time, which would be great for things like filter sweeps. Man, it's just, I did a whole separate video on this thing where I just kind of took 20 minutes and, and just went through a couple really cool sounds and ran them through a specular Tempest reverb and just kind of had a blast with it. And um, I'll, I'll post links to that. But um, it, I can't say enough good stuff about this. It's just a blast to play. Let's go to a different double program. I, I started creating some of my own.
Anyway, so that's that's the OBX8. The Roland Jupiter X. Um, this is one of the synths that a lot of people love to hate. Um, a lot of guys have real issues with Roland, which frankly I don't understand. Um, they all bellyache that it's not analog. Um, frankly, I couldn't care less uh, what's under the hood. What I care about is what it sounds like. Does it sound good and does it inspire me? Sounds huge. Right away, I know there's people thinking, oh, it sounds like a VST in a box. It, it just doesn't. And again, I've, I've owned vintage Roland synths. I love them to death, but I don't miss repair bills. Um, this thing inspires me just as much as a Jupiter 8 did and my JX8P, excuse me, my JX10. Now, I will say, one of the things I like to do, I like to turn the reverb off. I don't, I generally don't like built-in reverb in most synths. It's not that good. Anyway, it's, it's a fantastic synth. I love... Yeah, that's kind of goofy, but... The, the I arpeggio thing. I don't know, it, for me, it, it generates ideas. And do some downright wicked stuff. You got the Roland, Moog, and sequential filter models in here. Anyway, I love having these two together because they're kind of idea generators. The, the, the two, you know, together, they just interact in a really cool way. And, you know, they're just fun to have together. Anyway, man, someday I'd love to do just a, a full-on synth record with, with stuff like this. So that's the OBX8 and the Jupiter X. Um, just a couple sounds. Um, love those two. All right, moving on. Another two favorites. I, you know what? I should stop saying that. Everything in here, there's a, they're all favorites. But they're favorites for different reasons. The System 8, this is one of my favorite... Here we go again. 
since of the last decade probably because again it, it, it might be contentious to say but um, this completely stands in for me uh, for Roland's Analog Classics, the Jupiter 8, the Juno 106, the Juno 60, um, the Jupiter 4, uh, thanks to the new model of that one that they just came out with recently. It just, uh, I've compared this to the originals, and in any real world musical context, <laughs> it, it, it sounds totally within the same margin as any two vintage Jupiter 8s or Juno 106s. Um, Anyway, enough talking. I absolutely love this thing. Got some great stuff in here. Another thing is that the System 8's own native engine does some really cool sounds like this one. So another cool thing about this, let me find a sound that would... Yeah, you've got several different filter styles in here. Um, 18, 24 dB, 12 dB, you got a high pass filter. And then you can choose between, um, there's the special system eight filter, which does some cool stuff. Um, system one filter. Standard low pass filter, excuse me, uh, Jupiter 8 filter. And also, this that you get a choice of slopes with, with these as well, with each different model. So there's a 24 dB Jupiter 8 filter. Sorry, my high pass filter was on there. The Juno 106 filter. Anyway, so we got these System 8 sounds like that one and this one. Oh, and the effects on this one actually sound really good. So anyway, not to belabor the point, this thing is one of my favorite um, 80s oriented synths. It just does all kinds of great analog models and they sound fantastic.
The Matrix Brute. This thing is um, a bit of an odd bird. It, it is 100% analog. And the, the reason I, I love this thing is it, it's great at doing sequence stuff, like arpeggiated patterns. Some guys think that um, that Arturia stuff, that the oscillators sound thin or paper or whatever. I actually think they have a real texture to them that I like. It's different than anything else I have. Um, and this thing can do some monster synth basses right up there with Moog. That, that sounds huge. So again, uh, with these two, I was very intentional about putting them together um, along with the, the Pro 3, which I'll get to in a second. You know, I tend to kind of group my synths together in terms of the kinds of things that they do um, or the, kind of, the kinds of moods that they put me in. You know, the, these two or these three really, um, even though this one is not technically analog, it sounds analog and it does all of the, the vintage Roland analog stuff that I love so much. And so these are just a great pair to have together. Especially for this is in a different key right now because of a sequence, but anyway, so that's those two. Okay, the monstrous sequential Pro Three. This thing is, um, man. Need I say more? It's this thing can do Moog stuff. It can do sequential stuff. Ober, it's got an Oberheim filter in it. It is just, it's an absolutely bombastic, monstrous synth, especially for basses. <laughs> So it's just too much fun. This grunge knob over here. I, I mean, you know, wh what else can you say? Um, does classic sync stuff. I'm trying to remember there was a sound in here. I think it's um, uh, yeah, this is a cool sound. It's just really cool moody analog stuff. name this sound Hawkins because it reminds me of Stranger Things. Really cool. There was another one in here I wanted to try and find.
So yeah, the Pro 3. Um, one of my favorite creative toys uh, of the last several years. Absolutely killer synth. Okay, so now we come to the other side of the room where I keep the Prophet Brothers and the Moog Sub 37, which you can't see at the moment, but I will showcase that one in a second. So these guys, I did a video not too long ago when I got the OBX8 that compared uh, just one sound really between these two. And I'm not going to belabor the point. I'll put a link to that video here as well. But the um, first and foremost, the Prophet 5. I mean, and you're hearing a little bit of reverb from the Specular Tempest. This thing is just raw. It's in your face. It's iconic. So yeah, the, the Prophet 5, basses, synth brass, leads, big unison sounds. Another monster. So we come to then to the, the, the Prophet Rev 2. I generally leave the effects off because I like using effects, um, uh, outboard effects, but man, the effects in this thing aren't too bad couple things in it that I like. I don't, I don't really like the reverbs too much, but um, the chorus can be usable and the delays in here are pretty good. But the thing I love about the Rev 2 is for one, it's got 16 note polyphony and you can divide that between uh, when you go into layered mode, you've got two completely separate synths in one box. And even when you do that, you still have eight note polyphony. So you can get these big layered sounds uh, like Genesis fans will recognize that. But it can do these really thick, like Oberheim-esque pads as well. This is one, this is the sound I created for the comparison with the OBX8. And a lot of people said, this sounds pretty much identical but you get full eight note polyphony even when you've got it stacked and layered like this. So, the Rev 2. is uh, another favorite. <laughs> I said I wouldn't keep saying that and I keep saying it. So there you go. Ooh, this guy needs to be tuned. Um, that's the nature of these classic analog synths. Anyway, so there's the Prophet Brothers. Okay, this beauty, the Moog Subsequent 37.
Again, reverb from Specular Tempest. I like about this for one it just sounds like a Moog I mean it's a very distinctive sound but the multi-drive uh, aspect of the filter Again, I, I, you know, other than obvious Moog bass sounds, I like this for arpeggiated things. It You know, and other than the Sequential Pro 3 that I showed you, nothing does synth bass like a Moog. Um, the Sequential does, I mean, absolutely hangs with this, but there's just something about the sound of this. It's got its own unique thing. So yeah, sub 37. Okay, Hydrosynth and Access Virus. Um, first things first, the reason I have these two front and center in my workstation is because I use them as controllers for a lot of other things. The, the layout of the virus in particular is perfect for controlling soft synths because I've got you know my filter envelope right here, my amp envelope, all the typical oscillators and filters and uh, LFO controls. All this stuff is pretty standard for for pretty much any traditional synth, um, it, you know, software synth. So I, I tend to use this uh, as a controller, but it also has sounds. I mean, I've had a virus of one sort or another, um, talking about synthesizers here, <laughs> for at least 20 years. All the way back to the Virus A, I had a Virus C, a Virus Classic, I had a Virus uh, Polar TI, and then I ended up with... Uh, this one, which is the Virus TI. And um, it's just such a monster. Unfortunately, I don't have this one. Um, I, I gotta fix a cable issue, so I can't play you this one at the moment. It's killing me. But um, this thing to this day makes sounds that are just mind-blowing. It's a really wicked synth for, um, for techno and EDM and, and stuff like that. But it can also do really killer analog emulations as well. Um, Anyway, so that's why I have these two front and center. The Hydrosynth, this thing is a, a real standout. It, it does things that nothing else does, but uh, going back to the controller issue, why I have it front and center, um, I like to have, you probably can't see it at the moment, but my main controller here is 88 weighted keys in front of me. But there's times I don't want to play from a weighted action. I want to play from a synth action because it's faster especially if I'm programming, you know, percussion parts and stuff. But the Hydrosynth has a polyphonic aftertouch keyboard. So I can, um, let me find the sounds I was looking for here. Yeah, okay. Okay, that's not a great example. This is a great example. So on a regular synth with aftertouch, if you're holding a chord, and say your aftertouch is opening up your filter, if you're holding a chord and you press down on one note harder, it's going to open up the filter for all the notes you're holding. But with poly aftertouch, it's per key. So say I just want to emphasize the G here. Or the D. Or this G all the way at the bottom.
it's just got killer features as a controller. So you've got the polyphonic aftertouch keyboard. You've got this four octave ribbon controller that you can map to pretty much anything. Um, and at the end of the day, it just does some wicked digital sounds. It's like entering the matrix. <laughs> sound that I had up that um, is really really cool this one wave scan <laughs> this thing is, is it's insane watch this it kind of sounds like a DX7 um, on steroids if you start spinning knobs Ah, shoot. Pull up the wrong. Wrong sound. Anyway, it's just a real, real creative playpen and um, again it's killer to have this right in front of me uh, as a controller I, I've mapped a lot of the hydrosynth knobs to to my soft synths as well so access virus hydrosynth killer synths um, it, these two uh, you could put me on a desert island with just these two synths and I could make a lifetime of music really really cool stuff Okay, so Control Central here. This is where my right hand spends a lot of time when I'm not actually playing. Uh, Kensington Trackball Turbo Mouse. I've used these for 30 years. Love this thing. Uh, Apple Trackpad. I switch back and forth between these depending on what I'm doing. I, I like this thing for zooming and, and you know paging and all that kind of stuff. But I generally am a trackball guy. I just can fly on this. My monitor controller is a Grace M905. Um, this thing is a kind of a high-end um, monitor switcher. It lets me switch between three pairs of monitors. Um, it just is one of the best sounding monitor controllers I've ever heard. And it lets me uh, choose between different sources. My, my Apollo rig, um, I can choose between a USB input from one of my other computers. Um, it's got AES, uh, SPDIF in, ADAT inputs. It's just really, really cool, really flexible. And it also has two headphone amps on it. And the thing I really like about this is it's got a crossfeed mode where, you know, most headphone mixes, it's kind of artificially wide because the way that we hear speakers in a room is different than the way that we hear headphones because you've got them directly piped into your ears. So this crossfeed thing, it feeds a little bit of the left and right into the other to simulate the way that you actually hear. So it's really nice for, for you know, if you've got a mix late at night or whatever on headphones, that crossfeed feature is brilliant. And there's also a thing about this that lets me use four monitor pairs. By default, you've got three here, but you can use the sub output um, as a fourth monitor pair, which is perfect because I have four sets of monitors. I got my main PMCs, I got these small Yamahas that I do a lot of my mixing on, and then I've got a left and right pair on each side of the room. So anyway, that's my monitor controller. One of the coolest peripherals of all time is the Stream Deck. Now, these things um, are so, so handy. I use them all day long in pretty much every app. Um, like right now I'm in Logic and you know you can have multiple pages of things. So this is my main page, lets me choose between different tools, my automation curves, my editing modes if I want to crossfade or if I want to overlap regions or not overlap regions. On this side, this calls up my universal audio control panel. Um, this lets me write uh, different automation modes and so on. But you know, the sky's the limit. Um, this second page lets me 
turn on the arpeggiator for any channel, which is really handy. Um, it lets me tab, and I do tab to transient with this guy. Um, lets me instantly quantize to, to my most used values, uh, 16th notes, 24th notes, you know, whatever. Um, but the, the other cool thing is they instantly adapt to whatever app you're using. If I switch to Safari, my browser, all of a sudden, it, it, there's you know, some of the websites I go to a lot. Um, it lets me enter passwords. It lets me, uh, my, like my, gosh, my bank info, if I want to enter my account info for certain things, I can just hit a button. I don't have to remember all these things. It just does it for me. So, um, man, I can't say enough good stuff about the Stream Deck. These things are game changers for productivity. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the stream deck, um, get you one. They are very cool. I'll put a link to a lot of my stuff in the video description where you can, um, check them out for yourself. And if you want to buy any of this stuff, it helps me. Um, if you click on my affiliate links, um, you, you won't pay a penny more, but it, it helps my channel. So yeah, there you go. That's the stream deck. Uh, let's see what else. Can't forget about these two guys. Um, I have two effect pedals that uh, I absolutely love. First and foremost is the Specular Tempest. This is, to my ear, the best reverb I've ever heard, hardware or software, for big, dreamy, soundscapey type reverbs. Um, I've talked about it before. I used it in some of my other videos, like the, the Oberheim OBX8 video. I think 10 people ordered the Tempest after they heard that video. So again, check that video out if you want to hear it. The other pedal I have is this Microcosm Hologram. I don't know how to describe this thing, but it's like it slices and dices and chops up your audio and does amazing things with it. Um, turns it into arpeggios. It's hard to explain, but um, check that thing out. It's a real creative um, sandbox that lets you do some really, really wicked stuff. So that's the hologram. Okay, over here on my left, um, when I do all of my virtual instrument programming, um, I am always needing uh, lots of assignable controllers. So I am, and I'm always looking for new ones. I've been through so many different types. Um, recently, I had a pair of new controllers by a company called Intec from um, Hungary, from Budapest. And I really liked them. They were really small. It was basically just the size of these eight faders. So it was really nice to have next to my keyboard. But there were some things I didn't like about those. They, they It's hard to explain, but um, they didn't quite do what I wanted. So I saw on my friend Jamie Morden um, in the UK, he was doing a video on the OBX8, and he was talking about this Novation launch control. And I looked into that. Sure enough, they're, they're super cheap. It's like 120 bucks or something. Found it on Amazon. And it's got eight faders, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 assignable buttons, and let's see, 24 knobs. So that's a ton of controllers. And if that weren't enough, you've got eight user assignable scenes. So 24 knobs, 24 buttons, and eight faders times eight. So this thing, I think, is about as good as it's going to get for, for controls. It's also built really well. It's really thick and meaty feeling. It doesn't, um, it doesn't feel cheap at all. The, the faders have a nice resistance to them. So I use this for uh, certain things in Logic. I use it for controlling soft synths and my sample libraries. Um, anybody who uses lots of sample libraries knows that you need a good handful of controllers. So for, for example, for my Spitfire libraries, um, those tend to need a lot of controllers. So I've got um, CC11, which is Expression, uh, Mod Wheel, and then I've got Vibrato, uh, if I can remember these, uh, Tightness and uh, Legato Speed, whatever, uh, mic controls, uh, room mics, close mics, and so on. So yeah, Novation Launch Control, this thing is killer for controlling all kinds of things, and it's become my new favorite left-hand man. So that's what that is. Moving on from Controlville, there is a small handful of stuff that's not really, uh, you know, all that sexy, but 
This stuff is crucial to the studio. Um, let's see if I can get my hand over here. These are two of my drives that I take with me uh, if I need to work outside the studio. My um, RAID drive for doing video stuff and then my samples solid state drive that's got um, a ton of my libraries on it that I take with me. But this little box is absolutely crucial to the whole studio. This is a CalDigit TS3 Plus. It's the only Thunderbolt um, dock that I've tried that actually works. I've had this thing for three years now and it has been flawless since day one. And it really, it basically connects my laptop to the entire rest of my studio. Um, it's got an HDMI out that drives up to a 5K monitor. Um, it powers the laptop. It's got all the USB-C ports I need, USB 3, and it's got several ports on the front. It's got a really fast card reader, so when like I'm doing stuff like now, filming things, I can pop my SD cards out, pop them in here, it reads them really fast. So CalDigit TS3 Plus, I can't recommend that thing enough. Um, it runs my whole world. Uh, and then right next to that I have a USB hub. I don't know if you can see it. It's one of many Anker, uh, A-N-K-E-R, USB 3 hubs. I've got probably four of those networked throughout the studio. And um, there's one back there. See if I can get the camera back there. Uh, it's hard to see. But yeah, I've got tons of USB peripherals all connected to various Anker hubs. And then they all connect to the CalDigit. So... And then, down here on the floor, if I can get the camera to go down there, kind of hard to see, but a Helix. Um, I use the Helix as an effects device from Logic. I send a lot of sounds through that thing because it's got some really killer models in it, especially amp models, obviously, and distortion and, and all that kind of stuff. And I also run the, um, I run the Harpeggi through that thing when I track the Harpeggi. So that thing is a great... Um, effects unit, especially for guitar players, but especially for keyboard players as well who want guitar type sounds. And back there hiding in the corners is one of the best investments I've ever made. Those Monster PMC monitors. Um, these are the IB1S A3s. Um, it's a three-way monitor, but um, they're unlike anything I've ever heard. They're very expensive but they are worth every penny. I first heard them in a mastering studio in Nashville. Uh, Glenn Meadows at Masterphonics had a pair probably back in 2004, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, we were mastering a project I was working on, and I just never, ever forgot hearing those things. I thought, someday I'm going to have a pair of those. It took me a long time, but they were worth investing in because I have never heard any other monitor like those. They're just insane. So yeah, those are my PMCs. So my smaller near-field monitors, the inner pair are Yamaha MSP5s, which are kind of like NS10s. They have a similar sonic signature. Uh, they're very mid-range oriented. And um, I use those actually a lot for mixing because if you get things right, especially balances on those, it tends to translate really well. And then the smaller little pair um, our iLoud Micro something or other, I forget what they're called, but I use those when I've got to travel. Um, if I need to get work done, like in a hotel room, they're the perfect little speaker for that. They, they're really powerful for their size. They have a surprising amount of low end, and they, they sound like miniature professional monitors. So I really, really like those. Over by my synth stations on both my left and right, I have a secondary pair of monitors, and they are these Atom T8Vs. There's one back there in the corner, and then, you know, uh, the other one on the other side. These things are, are great. They're, they're kind of budget monitors, um, but Atom doesn't make a bad monitor. They, I, I've used them for years. Uh, I mixed for over a decade on a pair of A7s, and they were fantastic. Um, but I just wanted, you know, a secondary pair on the side so I could work in stereo when I'm programming my synths. And uh, so, yeah, I've really liked these, these T8Vs. Really great speakers. Last but not least, back here in the corner um, is my original Yamaha DX7 Mark I. Um, crazy thing about this thing, you notice it has wood sides. Um, when I bought this thing, it was from eBay in Japan, and it was in flawless condition. However, when they sent it to me, they 
didn't pack it well. So the sides came broken. So a friend of mine made me nice oak sides for it. And uh, so it's kind of a custom uh, version. And then back there behind it is my touring controller, a YC88, which is really, really great. It's got fantastic action, wood keys, physical drawbar controllers, and great piano sounds, built-in audio interface with XLR outputs. Um, so yeah, fantastic 88 note controller. So yeah, there you go. I think I've pretty much covered everything. One of the questions I get all the time when I post pictures about uh, gear or my studio, people are always asking me what stands I use with my keyboards. Um, and I want to tell you about them. This is not a sponsored video. There's no financial incentive for me to do this. I just believe in this particular product and I wanted to share it with you because I get asked about it all the time. So the stands I'm using uh, are called Stantastic. The model is either 102 or 103. KS, as in keyboard stand. Um, the thing I love about these stands is kind of like the old A-frame stands back in the 80s. They give you all that flexibility. You can put your keyboards at different angles and different heights, uh, really any way you want. Uh, it takes some experimentation to get them right. But the thing I like about these is they're much heavier duty than an A-frame stand. Every A-frame style tube stand I've ever had, they bounce and they wiggle when you play, especially with heavy keyboards. And I can't stand that, <laughs> pardon the pun. Um, I like my keyboards to be solid. I like to be able to bang on them and there's no wiggle, there's no bounce and you know, $5,000 synth like an Oberheim here, you don't want that falling. So um, I just can't say enough good stuff about those Stantastic stands. They are really rigid. They fold up to just, you know, a, a column basically if you want to transport them, but um, they're perfect for the studio. The other thing I love about them is they're not made of um, tubing. You know, I don't know if people know this, but back in the 70s and 80s, those, those ultimate support stands, they were made from hang glider parts. And you know, I'm just not a fan of that. I don't know about you, but for me, I like my studio to look clean and presentable, and I've got a lot of keyboards. So if I had those tube stands, if you look at pictures of, the, of those, like the Jaspers or, or whatever, they stick out beyond the sides of your keyboards. And so if you have multiple keyboards like I do, you know, there's a foot or so between them. You can't get them right up next to each other like I have mine here. Um, so, you know, the Stantastic stuff, you can put your keyboards right up next to each other because the stands, um, the uprights are behind your keyboards, not to the sides. So anyway, I, I don't know if this is helpful. I hope it is. Um, but just wanted to, to tell you what, what my stands are. Uh, I added a fourth stand. I've got, I think, 20 hardware synths in the room right now. Um, and they're all on these Stantastic stands. So there you go. Last thing, uh, the 103 KS, which is the model that I have, um, they come with three tiers, but you can add more. I have uh, four tiers on almost all of mine. And, uh, you know, again, you can change the height, you can change the angle, you can change the depth. Uh, and they do hold very heavy keyboards. I think they're rated at, um, gosh, it might be 100 pounds per tier or something like that. Anyway, there you go. I hope this is helpful. Thank you and stay in touch.